This time I will call the call board meeting of the Idle Statesville Schools uh, Board of Education to order for Thursday, October the 1st, 2020. Uh, board members, you have the agenda in front of you. Uh, I would like to add under call to order, uh, we'll go 1A, uh, Boy Nutting with an announcement. Uh, that's okay with you guys. After the call for order and before discussion, shouldn't take but just a few minutes. Then we will uh, move into the uh, discussions uh, and update. And this this meeting is being called simply to update the board on uh, the uh, plans for next week's opening of our elementary schools. So uh, hopefully we'll get a few details on that. Uh, and uh, be able to move on with that as expeditiously as possible. So, uh, any other additions to the uh, or to the agenda? Motion to approve. Second, Mr. Chairman. Got a motion, second, approved agenda as amended. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Dr. Nutting. You have an announcement for us. Good afternoon, Chairman Page, uh, Dr. James, and members of the board. This is just, if you check out this picture here, had an exciting thing happen yesterday at NB Mills. Um, Dale and Kelly Earnhardt showed up at NB Mills yesterday afternoon and handed Principal John Nicastro a check for $135,000. Woo! <laughs> Woo Um, this is from the Dale Jr. Foundation. Um, they also visited another school down in the Charlotte Mech School District, um, also with a gift. He made it very clear yesterday uh, that this is the beginning of a friendship and a partnership, um, and that he's very much looking forward to using these funds to, to make a big difference. You could have knocked John DeCastro over with a feather. Um, so... Uh, they're going to do. They're going to work on a, an EC playground. They're going to use some of these funds for um, smart TVs. Uh, he is already excited about using some of these funds for tutoring opportunities. The really cool thing about this, sometimes when you get money like this or strings attached, this was not. This was a check written out to NB Mills Elementary School, and they said, "We'll see you guys later." So. They are tremendous partners in Iredale County and our community. I know that for me, over the last 28 years, um, I've seen this kind of thing happen with Dale Jr. and with his dad many, many, many times. So um, we didn't ask for the help. He just knew we needed it. So uh, recognize our partners. As Dr. James likes to say, you know, it takes a village, and we are certainly happy to have Dale and Kelly in our village. Thank you. Thank you. I thought y'all would like to start out with something good. All right, now let's move into elementary back to school plans. Dr. James, Mr. Well, Ribbick. I'm going to ask Mr. Ribbick to come up, but as he's uh, making his way to the podium, of course the governor um, moved to allow K-5 to go back to school on October the 5th, and um, we did make a uh, rather quick decision, but uh, as I would let the general public know in our staff we're in constant communication with our stakeholders on a continuous basis so we've been hearing from teachers parents since um, COVID-19 has hit and of course uh, as I've said before no matter what decision we make there's always going to be winners and losers but in the K-5 world we're also part of a Wake medical group and I think soon to be Duke and I know Bowen and I are trying to share those, and Dr. Nutting and I are trying to share those responsibilities to attend those sessions. But again, um, we have data that uh, typically is not shown on, you know, Channel 3, Channel 9, etc. So we are keeping uh, up to date on data. If you uh, looked at the health report from our local um, 
Health Alliance here in Iredell County. Uh, the numbers show that uh, most all deaths have occurred. I don't think there's any under the age of 50. And those deaths were comorbidity, which means the individual had more than just COVID-19. They had diabetes, a lung disorder, COPD, um, several other underlying conditions. So there is a ton of data out there to support returning our students to school. And I will say this, one of the questions I'm interviewing for the superintendency that you guys asked the community, the staff, was what do you look for in a superintendent? And I think overwhelmingly this question came out. You wanted the decisions made filtered through the lens of what is best for children. Going back to school face to face is what is best for our children, period. You can't argue it. Uh, the data supports it, and we're, we, in my opinion, are doing innumerable harm educationally the longer we're out because we, uh, we know summer slide is about eight weeks. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars as a state, probably billions of dollars as a nation, to try to stop summer slide. Well, guys, this has gone on for 24-plus weeks. Um, don't know how we're going to catch this up. Um, it's going to take a lot of thinking. Uh, you know, and we've talked to some board members, you can't just rubber stamp these children and say move on to the next grade level without the prerequisite skills. You're going to fail when you enter that grade level. So there's a lot of work going to have to be done between now and the time school goes back into full session on what we're going to do as a nation to close the gap that's been created by COVID-19. Uh, and sometimes our politics and sometimes our laws. But that's where we're at today. It doesn't mean um, there's winners, and unfortunately people choose to be a winner or a loser, but we can't make decisions in a vacuum. And when we make a decision to come back, it doesn't mean we don't love our staff any less. We're not concerned about our staff any less. We're working diligently. I know Dr. Lassane's department to work, it, work with every individual that has concerns or health concerns that could put them at risk to see if they could do virtual. Uh, we could repurpose them for other, for other areas where we can. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we felt it best, uh, and the board and I felt it best, to bring our kids back as quickly as possible, providing a safe environment. I will say that we continue to work, Dr. Miller and his department continue to work on ways to make our classroom safe and prevent uh, contact uh, surface uh, transfer of the virus, which so far has not been proven anywhere. It is airborne. We're doing some things there that are pretty interesting. I think we're going to be a pilot site at um, the, the Brawley IB School, if I got that right. Uh, the Brawley IB School. So uh, Dr. Miller's working on that. There are some additional chemicals that the EPA has uh, allowed us to look at, and I believe it'll have a 90-day uh, surface, a contact surface of life. So some things we can do there to uh, make our schools even safer. But I will say today, there has been zero transfer from a student to a staff member, none. And between students, the transfer rate has been one third of 1%. It was misquoted on some program, 3%. It's actually one third of a percent. Between staff, 1%. So that is a testimony to all the hard work we're doing in the background to make sure we're providing a safe atmosphere for our staff. So that being said, I'll let John uh, tell you about the plans for K-5. Thank you, Chairman Page, members of the board, Dr. James. Before I start with Plan A, I would just like to recognize our teachers and staff for everything they've done during Plan B. Uh, when the governor announced Plan B was going to be what we started with, we knew as our team it was going to be the most difficult of the plans with teachers having to teach face to face and having to also focus on the remote days, Wednesdays and the days when students were not in the building with them. And I believe our teachers have risen to that. And um, I just thank them for what they've done during that time. We know it was stressful for them, but they did their best. And we thank them, their administration, teacher assistants, office staff, bus drivers, custodians, everyone. We appreciate your support as a board that we know you got multiple emails and phone calls about the challenges that were going on, but we felt nothing but support. So we appreciate you all for that as well. I just wanted to start off just with appreciation as we move into plan A, which we are very excited about. As Dr. James mentioned that 
that remote learning, we did the best we could and will continue virtual, but face-to-face, -face we know, makes the biggest impact on our students. So our plan for reentry for our students on October 5th is that all elementary students will be able to return face-to-face -face starting on Monday. And you all do have a copy of the PowerPoint at your place there. Um, students will be attending five days per week. So in elementary, will not have the Wednesday remote days. It's going to be as it was before COVID with it, five days per week. But we are going to continue to offer virtual instruction. We know there are families that are still not comfortable, and we want to be sure those families are taken care of and that we're doing the best we can for those students. So on the last page, I have updated you all on how many virtual students we are looking at starting next week. It looks like there will be 1,843 students who will be through uh, K-5 th who will be virtual. That is 23% of our enrolled elementary students. But I think good news with that also is that we were up to about 28% at one time, so we are having students come back now that we are offering the five days a week face-to-face -face with all students who want to be. If uh, families do choose virtual, we are asking them to remain virtual to the end of the semester unless the <clears throat> principal um, decides differently. This is to help with our planning. Right now, there are classes that are very full. And as you know, with our K-3 state allotment numbers, we have to remain under 21 students in a class. And if we continue to have students moving back and forth, our schools, our principals, have a very difficult time planning and with teachers who are virtual and then they'd have to switch and we'd have to continue to have that movement. Our principals have asked, can we please have a set criteria and date so that we can plan for the best that we can and we don't have to continue to switch our teachers and our classes. So as I said, we are asking if the family chooses virtual to remain virtual until the end of the semester unless the principal um, decides differently for that. But I think the best thing about Plan A is that teachers will no longer have to provide remote instruction. The face-to-face -face teachers will not have to worry about the students when they're not in the building. They will not have to worry about, what do I have to plan for Wednesday? I have to make sure I have all the assignments ready for the students and I have to check all of the assignments that they can, they can focus on the face-to-face -face students while they're there. And that was the the biggest frustration during Plan B was just that juggling act that had to be done, that with Plan A, teachers will not have to do that anymore. So when the governor did announce the Plan A, there are still some requirements we have to follow. And one is that masks must still be worn on the buses and in the buildings. We will be providing, as we have now, mass breaks and while students are eating, drinking, while they are outside, six feet apart, and then there will be breaks in the classroom when appropriate. But masks have to, will continue. We will also continue the daily health screenings as student, before students come in the buildings, which includes the temperature checks and the daily health questions that we have to ask each parent as either they're dropping them off or when the students fill out the forms to ride the bus that has the questions on there. We will continue social distancing as much as possible, but with all students returning, we are not able to guarantee six feet. But as I said, as much as possible, we will be able to do. So I've been in the schools and I've seen teachers are getting their classrooms ready and distancing as best they can. But as I said, we can't guarantee six feet, but we'll do the best we can with it. And then hand washing will continue as it has been because as we know with our younger students, that's one thing we make sure we have to do is continue to make sure the students are washing their hands regularly throughout the day. So as Dr. James said, one thing we're going to have to really focus on is catching up students as quickly and as effectively as we can because we know that they are behind, there's things they've missed. 
during this time, so we are preparing for that. We have completed our beginning of the year assessments, which includes our third grade, beginning of grade, and we've had our iReady assessments for reading and math, so we have data. And then another good thing is that third graders, when they return, they will also take the third grade assessments, so we'll be able to use that data, and teachers will be able to identify what the students need, and they'll be able to focus on those with small groups or individually or even as a class if that's a gap that everyone has. And schools are creating plans and have been since last year about when students come back, how are we going to close these gaps. So schools are already on this with planning. We started planning this as soon as we were out last year. And another good item is that this year we had summer jumpstart funds through the COVID acts and we saved money for our schools to provide tutoring from um, now until December because the money has to be spent by December but schools each school has 31 hours of tutoring that they can use between now and then to help catch up students who have gaps or missed considerable amounts of instruction and um, work during this time so I think we have some Good plans for the students coming into the buildings and trying to catch up students as quickly and as effectively as we can. So the next item is the busing and Mr. Armstrong is going to discuss that. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, busing uh, basically will look a lot like uh, it has with um, when we were under plan B. We will have uh, the only the main difference is, is that we will not have at least one student per seat. So there will be students, uh, more than one student in a seat in some cases. When we can have one student in a seat, we will, but uh, th that's not guaranteed. The, the one other thing is that mask will also be required for everyone to wear. Uh, and the bus drivers will, as they had with option B, they will have masks available for students that forget their mask in the mornings or in the afternoons. A seating chart is going to be key uh, for us to make sure that our bus drivers uh, have a seating chart and that they stick to that seating chart every day that the students are there. And. Um, so in case there is an outbreak, we would know exactly, you know, who's on the bus, where they were sitting, and who they came in contact with. One of the biggest differences that we will begin starting on Monday is that we will have alternative uh, drop-offs for students after school. When I say alternative drop-off is where they go to the Boys and Girls Club or Statesville Fitness Center and other places, daycares uh, for after school care. So that will be a difference next year, I mean, uh, starting next week. Uh, that's something that we've done in the past and we'll begin to do it again. We are recommending we cannot make it, but one of the things that would help us greatly as a school system is that uh, parents continue, if they can, to provide uh, transportation for their sons and daughters to schools. Um, a lot of parents just felt safer uh, with option B for transporting their students. And we're continuing to recommend that they do that. This will help us with social distancing. I met with Kim Fox this morning, and one of the things I was happy to hear is that none of our elementary buses are near capacity. Uh, the, uh, they will, an elementary bus at full capacity will hold 72 students. Um, and so the, the largest bus our largest capacity that we have as of yesterday was at 48, 48. Um, that's who's assigned to the bus, who actually shows up. It, you know, it could be a little bit more, it could be less. And one of the things that, and I know Dr. Miller's going to address this, is that uh, all of our elementary buses will be treated with a safeguard, surface guard, that will uh, help maintain um, the sanitation of those buses while we're using those buses and will just give us an extra layer of protection for our students and our drivers on those buses. 
Are there any questions about busing? I got uh, just one thing. Um, we reach out to all our students, no matter where you are. But I had some in the Lakeshore Middle School District. And, of course, I called Martin and I called Todd to make sure, hey, listen, this is your, kind of your overlapping district, but they call me. And I just want to tell you, thank you on that incident at Lakeshore Middle School where the child got moved up. She was in last year the bus came in. Well, now, because of the family, disability, and whatnot, and it was sent to you, and it's been handled at Lakeshore Middle School. So, and she's coming to school. Their parents said we want her to go to school. The right. father's on his disability. She lives with the grandparents, but she said if you can work it out so that she doesn't have to walk as a 12-year-old girl a mile, and you did it. So, she's staying with us, and she's going to school. So, thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Laugh. What are you laughing at? <laughs> All right. <laughs> but I shared it with my other board members because, like I said, we represent every child. But you in somebody else's district, I want to make sure they knew it. So Absolutely. We came out Thank good you. on that one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Armstrong, do we have a hand sanitizer on our bus? Yes, we have sanitizer for students. Uh, it's a moving classroom, mobile classroom. And so everything with the mask and the hand sanitizer is there. Um, the cleaning supplies are there as long as the driver. The biggest problem we're having now, but I think our drivers are getting better, is that when they are off of the bus, they need to remove those cleaning uh, uh, articles with them but when they don't and they sometimes forget we we remind them i'll put it that way to make sure they take them off when they're not on the bus okay thank you well the chemical that you're putting on the buses is also the 90-day chemical dr miller yes, yes it's the 90-day Well, everybody's always asking about this and the cleaning, and uh, we, we feel like we're prepared. We know that there are going to be cases. You're not, you're not going to keep a case from happening, but we're doing everything we can to be sure that it, if it does, it's going to be a, a rare instance. So what we've done is the surface garden, just to give everybody a little background on that particular product. Uh, that's an EPA-approved product. There's two types of disinfecting and cleaning. One is chemical, one is mechanical and what they call surface guard is mechanical. And what it does, it's uh, electrostatically applied and it adheres to the surface and once it dries, it's like a film on that surface. And it is a multitude of little spikes at the atomic level. So when a virus or a germ or, or settles on it, it penetrates the surface and that's how you degrade and kill a virus or a germ, is you have to penetrate the uh, surrounding protective membrane. And so that's what it does. And that will last on the surface for 90 days, up to 90 days. Now, if you take sandpaper or, or steel wool, you could rub it off. But just general cleaning with soap and water or disinfectant is not gonna take it off. So we're gonna continue to do, that's our first level of, of preparation. Then we're gonna continue to do our cleaning procedures and our disinfecting procedures. That's a second level of protection. And if we do have an incident, what we've done is we have a rapid response group in our custodial uh, staff that will go in and electrostatically clean and disinfect uh, any of the rooms or areas where that particular positive case has been. And so we've been able internally to do a lot of that. So. Uh, we feel pretty comfortable with our cleaning and disinfecting procedures and protocols, and these are things that we hope we will be able to continue even after COVID for future potential pandemics or viruses or flu season or any of those. Because if you look at our attendance during flu season, we have a tremendous number of kids that are out of school because of flu during flu season. So these are protocols and things that we've got in place that we feel like are going to be good regardless of the COVID situation moving forward in the future. Um, as we move forward, if we move into our middle and uh, high schools, we will follow those same procedures. We'll be doing surface guard uh, at the high schools and middle schools as well. We'll be doing that. We're concentrating on the elementaries right now due to the fact that we're going to be coming back in uh, A, Monday. But we will be doing the high schools and middle schools as well. Uh, one of the things we're looking at in conjunction with the county, our LED project that you're familiar with, we've uh, increased that LED project a little and we're looking at bipolar ionization, which is the state of the art disinfecting in the uh, HVAC systems. And Brawley, 
uh, is fortunate enough they have a gentleman that has kids that go to Brawley and he is going to donate the bipolar ionization at Brawley and it's going to be installed at Brawley and we're going to run some some numbers and some data to see how that affects you know our absentee uh, at the school as we move forward so we're looking forward to that and we'd like to move that over for future it's not going to happen immediately but for future we'd like to move that over to all of our schools moving forward so that we can start looking at future situations and and being prepared for those uh, we've got plenty of materials and plenty of supplies in our warehouse uh, the schools have currently we're up to a hundred and almost thirty thousand items that have been sent to the schools hand sanitizer you know disinfectant uh, mask shields uh, sneeze guards everything that you can think of the schools need it we try to provide it for them so moving forward we feel we feel comfortable we know we're going to be tweaking our our protocols and our plans and we'll be improving them every day hopefully uh, be glad to answer questions anything related to this dr miller yes sir. what's the uh surface guard cost the doing all of our elementary schools is 22 and the buses is twenty two thousand dollars for that application uh, we feel like that'll get us through till christmas on those elementaries uh, we use covid funds on that we did not use local funds i just want to uh publicly say thank you to whoever it was that uh, donated that down at uh, brawley that'll give us the opportunity to test drive that that piece of equipment i know that's something you've been wanting to do for a long period yes. of time and that'll give us the opportunity to test it in real time and see that it works before we invest that kind of money in something absolutely whoever it was that that did that we do really do appreciate it absolutely. on behalf of all of our students any other questions thank you dr miller and again thank you to all your staff for all the hard work they're doing thanks sir thank you Good afternoon, board, Dr. James. Uh, school nutrition will continue feeding as we have been doing in Plan B, except we are excited to have our students back in the elementary school. Uh, this is a huge success for our district and for school nutrition. Uh, right now, under Plan B, we've been doing a combination of feeding in the classroom, staggered lunch schedules, curbside service, and we've started bus deliveries back up. Uh, so this is going to change a little bit under Plan A. We will continue curbside pickup as needed. I have found out since we've started getting numbers back, a lot of our schools, 80% are coming back. I'm excited about that. And as my cafeteria staff have started questioning uh, the people that's been coming up picking up meals, uh, some of our curbside service is going to go to maybe five families, you know, and we can't feasibly keep that open for that limited amount of meals. However, what I've instructed our staff to do at those low number sites, to go to a neighboring school, or a lot of our cafeterias are going to post their cafeteria number at the pickup site, and the family is going to call them when they're there to get their meal, and that way a staff can still send those meals out. Because we still want to capture those kids that are not in school and not deny them a meal right now. Because thankfully we are still under the summer feeding program through December where all children can eat free. And we want to close any gaps, even under Plan A, that we can uh, with any child. Um, as I said, lunches will take place using staggered lunch schedules. I have instructed my managers to work with their principals as needed to work out how they feel is safe to get their students to the cafeteria or continue feeding in the classroom. We've got all different options out there and I've instructed our managers to work with each principal as needed. And they have kept me informed of each school's uh, plan to feed. Uh, some still going to, are going to come to the cafeteria. Some of the principals are wanting to get back to some kind of normal for them. But they'll be still distance as much as we can and staggered lunches to keep from having so many in the cafeteria at one time. And that will be mostly for our older students. A lot of our younger students um, 
they'll come to the cafeteria and the older students will come to the classroom, pick their meal up, and take it either outside or back to their classroom. Um, and um, also, uh, we're going to continue some of our bus deliveries uh, where we feel there's still a high need. Uh, of course, it costs to run the buses, pay the driver, mileage for the bus, gas, and uh, we're trying to keep those numbers to where it's at least sending out 50 meals or more on a bus. If not, we're looking at collapsing that to maybe some of our, couple of our vans. But again, we still want to close that gap for those children that are still doing virtual. Um, Kenny is also contacting me, and we are doing the safeguard uh, surface guard. I don't know how that got. Anyway, in the cafeteria also, in the uh, dining hall and in our kitchens, and so that's good. Plus also our Alco chemical company, they did find a food grade sanitizer that we can use in our kitchens and on our lines uh, in between students coming in. I've also pulled all keypads. No children will be touching anything. They'll be coming through the line one at a time to receive their wrap meal whether on a tray or individually wrapped for them to pick up. Uh, and all kids will be rung up by our cashier behind a safety shield. And there's also shields on our serving lines for protection for our staff and for our students. Um, and, of course, Plan A, as I've already said, it's going to be a plus getting our children back in because that is our revenue. That's what operates our program. Under Plan B and Plan C, I was looking at possibly laying off employees, furloughing some, which I didn't want to do, and I'm hoping this is going to keep us from doing that. Uh, we have not hired uh, positions, over a dozen positions that I have open. We did not hire any at the beginning of the school year. We did not hire any additional subs we've been using from our high schools that have not been open and moving employees around, which has been another heartache. But... As I've told my employees, you're still working. It might not be at your home school, but you're still working. So Plan A is going to give us much-needed revenue that we need back in our program. And another thing that also is a plus for our program, and I shared it with our district team leadership. I hadn't had a chance to share it with our board, but I got an exciting email Friday afternoon late from DHHS who sponsors our supper programs. As you know, we've got supper programs in some of our schools, and the criteria on that has to be 50% or higher free reduced and some type of enrichment program going on. Well, I switched all our programs that I could to the supper program that met that criteria. I even went back this year when I found out under summer feeding, we could not claim the after school snacks. It's a breakfast and lunch or one meal and a snack. So the first few weeks, I lost that snack. So it wasn't a whole lot. I think it was about $1,500. But at this time, it was $1,500 I couldn't afford to lose. So I switched them quickly to the supper program so that we could get that reimbursement because it's two separate programs. Well, Friday afternoon, I got the email that I, cannot, that I can apply and get approved our Southern End County, that is not 50% or higher in free. There is a waiver right now that we can sign those sites up that has after-school tutoring and primetime sites that I've been billing because they didn't meet, even for snacks I was billing because they did not meet the 50% criteria. Well, under the supper program, with the waiver, I can get those sites approved. And the additional plus on that, once approved, they can eat on the supper program for up to five years if we see fit. So that is huge, and it helps prime time too because now I won't have to be charging him for those snacks, and the children can get three meals a day. And that's extra revenue also for our program to support our program. So exciting news there that I'm happy to share with all of y'all. Any questions for me? Thank you, Tina, and as usual, you do a marvelous job feeding our children. Thank you. So if a staff or student does test positive or we're informed that they are, have tested positive, schools will continue their current plans that they have been doing in Plan B where contact tracing occurs. And if that happens, then the class may have to be quarantined or the teacher or 
certain class members might be um, quarantined for a set period of time. That is going to continue. And we know cases will continue, and schools have done an amazing job so far when that has happened, and I know that will continue moving forward. And then employees are pre-approved to telework for two weeks during quarantine if health permits for that. So basically, we're just going to continue what we've done during Plan B if um, there are positive cases. Jonathan, I would like to make a quick mention of, of our quarantine uh, protocol is very strict in the schools. Uh, I believe Dr. James had said uh, most businesses could not operate with the quarantine protocol that we have. No, uh, it's, uh, it's very, very strict, a lot more strict than most anywhere else, I think. So I did want to say that. Uh, so again, we're always looking on the very best way we can protect our staff and our students. Thank right. you. Dr. Lassane, okay. how are you today? Doing great. I hope everyone um, is also. We can go to the next slide. I just wanted to give you a little update on particularly the accommodations and leave realm for human resources. We are in the process of looking at um, those individuals who are already on accommodations for elementary school um, and reevaluating those. We have two particular areas that we have to look at very closely. Right now, we have some teachers who are virtual in the building, which they may be in a separate room and someone else has oversight of their students in another room and they're chiming in and teaching virtually. And so obviously for both reasons of space, as well as the capacity of the human resources, we are looking at all of those requests to see if under plan A, is that still reasonable um, for us to do as much as we can. Um, we also have some individuals who are on telework and it's important that you understand this, that based on the needs of the school or as we have to move people across the district, that may no longer be reasonable as we um, open up to more students being on our campuses. Um, we also have already seen and we project seeing additional increases in accommodations or leave requests. We have employees who have health conditions of themselves as well as other members of their family who are um, experiencing things that maybe when we were on plan B that was acceptable but on plan A, the concerns from their medical provider have increased and so they are putting in requests for accommodations and leave. We have also been working diligently with principals. As, as a matter of fact, right before I came here, I got off the phone with the principal who's having to make some other moves and the next question was, tell me about your numbers. And so as we're making those, we're trying to also say that where maybe our enrollment is not up to where we need it to be and we could experience a reduction or a move, we're trying to do those um, in the background also with as, as little disruption um, as possible and we have been able to do um, some of those successfully. We collaborate, we have a whole team that works on um, quarantines and positives. And so I think that um, I personally want to give a shout out to the health department for their collaboration with us as a school district because I talked to many of my um, colleagues and just the timeliness of us working together to get documentation to make sure that we have protected our sites as quickly um, as possible. Um, I could not ask for better collaboration from our internal team as well as that collaboration with the health department and the agencies that we've had to contact to say, Let it, let's work on these dates. What is the date that this person can return or can you send this documentation to us? And so that is extremely helpful with the volume of requests we're dealing with at this time. So those are a few updates in the area of accommodations and leaves. I'm glad to entertain any questions you have for those areas or HR in general. Dr. Lassane, are you still having a lot of retirements? Our retirements are increasing. Thank you. Yes. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. So just a few other items that we will be opening our playgrounds. I know parents are happy about that and students. As soon as the governor did announce that that could be available, we got calls right afterwards of parents asking that, can my child please play on the playground? My, especially my kindergartner who's been watching their brother or sister play on that playground and they can't wait to do so. So we are opening our playgrounds. Um, students will need to stay distant and we're going to have hand washing as soon as they're finished on those, that equipment. We're opening up our fields for recreation use. And we are going to continue our no visitors recommendation, meaning you know parents who want to eat lunch with their students, we're just going to wait on that still. We just don't have the space to distance if parents are coming in to eat with their child. And just for another thing for our administration and staff to have to focus on, they'd rather focus on their staff and their students rather than who else might be in the building during the day. So I do have a few principals here just to share out briefly about what they're looking at for their school. Uh, Chris Grace from Lakeshore Elementary, Andy Mihal from Cloverleaf, and Keeley Ward from Union Grove are just going to share out quickly about what is going to be happening at their schools. Jonathan, and thank you, principals. Uh, please feel free to tell us what is, you're doing special or different. We've had a really good explanation of the basic groundwork. Okay. Uh, a couple of our board members do work, and so anyway, just... Okay. Not, don't want to go over the same thing again. So just tell us what you're, you're doing yeah, special. That's fine. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, differently at Lakeshore, I mean, everything that Mr. Rubick just said is, is what we're doing. I want to say that when the governor announced this coming back to Plan A a couple weeks ago, I walked around the building. Um, the next morning, like I always do, walked into a classroom and the whole class just started yelling five days a week in a chant. So I think um, from my perspective, our kids are excited. Um, parents that I've talked to are excited about coming back. Our teachers are very excited. Um, to reiterate what Mr. Rubik said, they don't have to focus on three or four different modes of instruction. We can either do virtual or face-to-face. -face. Um, they're very excited about doing that. And, um, what Dr. James said, doing what, what's best for kids. Um, we'll still be focusing on all the uh, morning protocols. We will be using the cafeteria. Um, they will not be six feet. We are looking at about two or three feet from, for students, but um, the classroom would be the same. So whether it's the classroom or the cafeteria, kids will be getting back into a normal, as normal a routine as they can. So. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. James, uh, all is the same, uh, same protocols, same procedures. Uh, we're just thankful you gave us the box to work inside of and you give us the opportunity to lead and, and you know, act out exactly what Dr. James put forth. And we're just appreciative of all that flexibility and we appreciate everything. And at this point, you know, the biggest difference for us is uh, we're moving into 100% of the kids and give the parents more choice to come back and able to... Uh, kind of lighten up their pocketbooks a little from the extra care they've had to pay for and other things that have been going on. So again, appreciate it, and we're uh, all excited to get back uh, next week. Good afternoon, and I won't talk long, I promise. Um, but I just wanted to basically say that at Union Grove, we have followed this plan that was presented since day one. We have been fortunate to be able to strategically do so. Um, the biggest thing is basically um, what everyone has reiterated was strategically planning duties, um, instruction for the social distancing, um, down to the who carries the caddy out to the buses with the cleaning supplies. That was a duty um, to make sure it was off the buses and put back. Um, so it has worked well. We have a lot of students coming back on Monday um, and... I appreciate the opportunity to move from four days a week to five days a week. Thank you. Uh, I've visited a couple of uh, elementary schools, and the teachers are so excited to be getting back. Uh, and uh, so thank you. And board members, questions of uh, uh, Jonathan or uh, Mr. Ribbick or uh, any of our principals, uh, 
Mr. Chairman, uh, I do have one question for Mr. Ribbick, and I have one for Mr. Armstrong as well. Uh, the first question is, we were told we were going to still have state testing. Is that still on? It is. So our students are going to be responsible to take those state exams. Is that they right? They are, and that's another reason why I'm so happy we're coming back, because, this, yes, we've been told flat out by the federal government there will be no waivers this year right so we have to be ready and that's one reason why teachers were stressed during this time they heard that and they were like I, I have kids who are not on the zoom calls i have students who are not doing their work and it's difficult for some of them a lot of them to do that so bringing them back will help tremendously for that part okay thank you and mr armstrong since the governor made his move yesterday i think uh are we going to have middle school sports uh, yes. Uh, as soon as I watched the uh, broadcast yesterday and I emailed Burt Jenkins, he's the DPI uh, rep um, and for middle schools, and he said basically it's an LEA decision. So what I reported to you all on September 14th, if we go to phase three, what's going to be interesting is what that will look like. And so... I'm going to um, have a, a meeting soon, and, and the middle school principals don't even know this, but I'm going to work with Kelly Cooper to meet with, uh, virtually meet with our middle school principals and athletic directors on being very methodical on what that will look like. But I've had a lot of questions already, but the, the short answer is yes, sir. Thank you. And Mr. Howell, uh, one, one of the decisions I guess Richard and the team has to make I guess with some of my input, but um, middle school sports being daylight savings time, uh, our middle schools don't have lights on their fields. And we'll have to make a decision there if we're going to start sports earlier or if we have to shift it to the high school. And of course, you being an athletic director, understand if we shift it to the high school, there's a lot more field expense at the high schools when you start using the field much more. So we've already had the high school's ADs. The high school ADs have reached out. And, of course, understandably, if it's going to be played on their field, if there will be additional funding to help support field maintenance because there will have to be additional grass sowing, et cetera. So we'll come back with a plan, hopefully, that suffices for both groups. I would like to say I was very disappointed in, in what the governor said yesterday as far as phase three. It really did not, it looks like phase 2.6 to me, not phase three. So I, I question how much help he really gave us yesterday. So. Yeah, and one of the things, uh, Mr. Page, that helped me, yesterday I was on a Zoom meeting with the North Carolina Athletic Directors Association, and we got a chance to listen to athletic directors from across the country who already, they're ahead of us with athletics. And so they face these challenges that we're going to face but there were ways to work through them, and I, I was glad. That the timing was great. Uh, I heard that Zoom. Uh, I was on the Zoom call at, from 1 to 2, and then at 2 o'clock the governor made his announcement, but it's doable. You know, it's doable. It's, it's just going to look different. Well, thank you for all your, everybody's hard work and your, your group. Uh, any other questions of our elementary people? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask all of the, the principals and Mr. Ribbick, uh, under your curriculum update, you say that, you, that each school has summer jump start funds. Do you at this time have a plan on how uh, what that is going to look like? Is that going to be after school? Is that going to be on Saturdays? Or, or what's your plan on that? And maybe the principals can speak also. Yeah. The overall plan was when we got the funds, you cannot use them for during the day instruction or tutoring. So it would have to be an after school activity for those students. But I can let, if anyone you want to talk about what you're doing with the tutoring plan. So we get 31 total hours and we identified second and third graders because it had to specifically be used with second and third graders. I have three teachers who are willing to stay after school and work with them and they will be working on them starting Monday, Mondays and Thursdays until the 31 hours runs out. So we identified second and third graders, approximately 10 second graders and 10 third graders to stay and be worked with in small groups to close their gaps. Are those guidelines applicable to all elementary schools? Yes, the focus is supposed to be on second and third grade. However, 
if there if you do have some other teachers willing you can go a little outside of that but the focus should be on second and third grade because that's where literacy is essential is, is it going to be required for these students that have taken the beginning of the year exams or is totally optional it's optional we can't force any of them to stay for it's hard some can't stay after school for tutoring so those that can will do the best we can with and then um, we'll see where we go from there we are I am working on also a grant for hopefully after January to start another tutoring program with our four and most at-risk schools I'll see what happens with that will we be providing bus transportation uh, when it's over in the afternoons we don't we don't have the funds for that we weren't given enough funds for that part of it and what is the teacher compensation going to be Melissa has that um, our standard tour rate is $25 an hour for a certified employee best of luck and thank you for everything thank you. I do want to say uh, we really need to look at what we need and if we need additional uh, tutoring to bring these kids up we need to look under rocks have Melissa turn some rocks over uh, dr. James this is we we've got to do by our kids if we need that's correct we need to you know 31 hours is not a whole lot it no, is it's better than nothing it is but let's let's oh, so look at what we can do for what we need to do yeah and that's why I'm glad we're doing this so when we can reassess come December and say all right how did it go how many kids were able to be there what were the barriers and if we see busing would help out maybe we can look at another program come the winter spring where we can have some busing for it at, for our most at risk um, we do have the uh, primetime program that'll be cranking back up at each elementary site so that's a way yes. for us to sort of provide tutoring inside that program so it helps but yeah the answer to the question it, it, it was a crumb where we needed a loaf of bread so that's where our politicians come into play that we need their voice at the table because it's going to take hundreds of millions of dollars to catch our kids back up to where they were or suffer the ramifications in our society of not doing that for years to come thank you thank you all all right we'll hear now uh, from uh, Kelly Cooper and some secondary principals uh, what we've got in uh, so chairman page is Kelly's coming to the podium with uh, middle school principals one of the biggest concerns we've heard from plan B and I will I will tell the board commend our staff they've been troopers and they've had to, to weather some storms with people maybe not understanding all the things we are doing but plan B is double duty if you're not zooming but teachers who have uh, technology competence and can zoom can uh, teach the lesson one time and capture all their students but not everyone's at that place nor are schools equipped to do synchronous learning but we're heading down that path uh, I hope quicker than uh, quicker than I would like us to or I would like us to go fast as we could but not as quick as I would like us to but again that's all in dollars but we'll hear about synchronous learning today but again we're we're understanding that B is very hard to do we did ask for Wednesdays to be sort of a sacred day to do a little bit of office hours but to allow our teachers that are doing plan B to decompress uh, we know it's uh, it's a str it's a stressful situation on teachers staff superintendents boards uh, it's not an easy thing we're trying to do we're trying to be all things to all people and it's apparent that we cannot sustain this ongoing with plan B so we're we're going to as we push forward depending on what the governor does is, is asked our board and our parents to allow us that Wednesday to take a deep breath and prepare for the other group of students coming in because right now we're wearing our teachers out at, at a very high rate and we have to consider you know the teachers in this mix because they are the people that are there in the classrooms delivering it day to day but synchronous learning when these guys uh, talk to you about it is a way to uh, help eliminate some of that but again it's one of those things we're about five years behind on is every school system in this country so we have a plan and I look forward to Kelly presenting it thank you okay chairman page um, and members of the board one of the things I would like to definitely say and point out before we get started is that with our teachers um, every teacher is a beginning teacher this year and I know some of you were teachers at some point or you've lived with a teacher and your first year of teaching is the hardest year you'll ever teach 
Um, you spend a lot of time trying to find resources because everything is brand new. So a career teacher a lot of times can pull out some lessons, tweak them, and be able to move with it. But your first year is absolutely the hardest. Every teacher we have in this district right now is a first year teacher. Um, they started it back in the spring and they're finishing it now. And it has been very, very difficult and very hard. And they've put a lot of work into it. We have found that our teachers who are a little bit more comfortable with technology and are a little bit more comfortable in their own skin seem to have a little bit easier time because teaching is messy. When you're in the classroom and you're teaching and you've got kids, whether they're virtual or whether they're in the room with you, sometimes things don't go the way that you want them to. And if you're video streaming your classroom, you're opening up your messy to the world. Um, you've got parents who are sitting at home right beside you. So some of our teachers are a little bit afraid to do that. Um, however, we found that our teachers who have gone ahead and planned for the week like they're normally teaching, allowed their students at home to zoom in, have probably had it a little bit easier than our teachers who are trying to do double duty by planning for the kids that are at home, planning for the kids that are in the room, planning for the kids that are all virtual. Um, that's hard work. So I'd like to show you a quick video clip and then I'm going to let you talk to two of our teachers who have been doing that synchronous learning in their classroom and have been inviting kids at home into their classroom. It's not fancy, it's done with her computer and it gets a little bit messy sometimes. Today we're gonna have lots of activities. The class hopefully is going to go by so fast because I'm going to be speaking fast and let's have to have a mask break and so I don't pass out. Um, so I'm gonna be speaking fast. We're gonna watch some video clips. We got a discussion board and I've got a little um, demonstration activity over here. If you're virtual online, I'm actually going to pick up my computer and I've got a spot to move it to. So you will actually see the virtual live activity. You will not miss that. Okay. Does anyone have any questions before we get started? All right. Guess what you get to do? You get to talk, right? Um, you got two questions. If you're on virtual, I just want you to use the chat box. Answer your two questions. Uh, what plate boundary causes earthquakes? What do you think causes earthquakes? What plate boundary do you think causes mountains and seafloor spreading? And what do you think the lithosphere means? What or who can impact the lithosphere? All right, two minutes, go. teachers from ASEC, the early college, and I actually got to be in her room while she was doing a virtual presentation. She was doing a demonstration with the kids. She had kids at home in chat and in Zoom rooms with the kids that were in the classroom. It was amazing. And I asked her kiddos, I said, so tell me, what do you like about this? And one of her little guys looked at me, he said, to be honest with you, I like this better than I did when we all came every single day. He said, because I come in here, I get help from her. Then some days I can be at home and I can zoom into the classroom. He goes, and I am much more organized right now than I've ever been because all my teachers are using Canvas. They all got their assignments in the right spot. He goes, I'm rolling this year. He goes, and last year, to be honest with you, he goes, I was a mess. Thank you. All right. Thank you for um, allowing me to come here and talk about the opportunities that I've had this year. And I'm going to start off with saying that I am a 23rd year teacher and um, I'm hands-on. My learning environment is hands-on. It's collaborative. Kids move around. Kids talk to each other. I move around. I talk. I talk fast. And um, when Mr. Wells came and told the staff that, hey, you're going to be doing live online and kids in your room at the same time, you probably didn't want to see my face. Okay, because that was um, very difficult for me to process what that would look like in a classroom where we're all moving, we're all collaborating, and we're all learning um, hands-on at the same time. Um, but I have this poster in my classroom, and it's an Apollo 13 poster. And right under it, it says, is this a crisis or is this an opportunity? It took me a few days to process that. But I said, this is an opportunity for me to grow, for my kids to grow, for me to say, I'm rolling up my sleeves and I'm jumping in and I'm going full speed ahead, but I couldn't do it without support. Um, within a few days, Mr. Wells, I said, I've got to have a document camera. I'm doing labs. He had a document camera for me. Um, we have a, another teacher on our staff that's like the canvas queen. 
If I had questions about Canvas, she's going to help. So we all really bonded as this team. We started helping each other out because we want our students to have the same educational rigor, the same educational standards that they would get if they were in person with me as much as possible. And I'm not going to say it's not hard, okay? We, have the, we had a power outage for three hours one day at the school. Okay. Um, we ha we've had Wi-Fi out for several hours one day. Um, and we, we figure it out, and we keep going, and we keep having our kids. Um, we keep holding expectations for them. But I know you guys don't want to sit and hear about me and how I feel about this. I want to share some of the things that uh, my students say about this. I, I just I, I feel like feedback is really important as a teacher. And every um, six to eight weeks, I get their feedback. And I did it on engagement in the classroom. Ninety five percent of my kids chose a level four out of five as engaged. Now, some of these kids are at home, virtual, full-time. Some of them are in person two days a week. Some of them are in person in my room four days a week. 95% said, I'm engaged in your classroom. Gave me a four out of five for the learning environment. That, that was huge to me. And the, and the number one thing they said was engaging was turning and talking to other students. Whether they're talking in a breakout room, whether they're talking with someone that's six feet away from them, whether they're using a chat box to communicate, but turn and talk and then demonstration and labs continuing that um, was number one. So I'm not saying it's not hard, but I'm saying we come here every day, and I know Ms. Welch is going to say the same thing, and we do the best we can, but we look for ways to support ourselves and to support each other during this, and I think that's been the biggest thing. Um, I've developed a mission in my teaching career, and that mission has always been to engage, equip, and encourage. And when the most um, common positives that my students said about the classroom environment was, we smile, we make learning fun, and we're positive. It's really a mindset shift, and when we can shift our mindset, then we can do great things. And I appreciate the opportunity for you guys to let me speak today. Thank you. Next, I'm bringing Lauren Welch, um, or Welch to you. She actually is one of the most amazing teachers, too. These are both rock star ladies, and I got to visit her classroom. And she was actually doing um, something where she had the kids at home and the kids in the classroom talking to each other. So I'm going to let her talk to you. And she told me it was messy at first. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Oh, can I take my mask off the top? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Hi, thank you so much for allowing me to come to you guys today and talk to you. And a lot of what I want to say has already been addressed by Ms. Shadroy and Ms. Cooper that um, about the messiness and about the hardships that the teachers have been facing this year. Um, and, you know, th those are very real, but I don't want to spend my time today talking to you about how things are hard because I know that you guys know that things are hard. Um, we have had difficulties, but the truth is there is real learning happening in our schools. So like Ms. Cooper said, um, one thing that I've been working on uh, for the past two years, because this is my third year teaching, is um, getting kids to engage with each other, um, especially to practice discourse and how to, you know, I know that we probably all saw the debate the other night, how to practice discourse in a civil way, to talk to each other, to give each other space to talk and listen. And so one thing that I've been working on is engaging them in kind of like Socratic seminars where they're able to discuss with each other. And so I grade them on the quality of their discussion, on their using textual analysis, um, and how many times they're contributing. Are they being respectful? Are they inviting others into the conversation? Are they saying, hey, Ms. Cooper, what do you think about document eight? What was your take on that? And to really work on this feeling of community in my classroom, even though not all of my students are there in person and some are at home. Another thing I've been working on is um, a jigsaw project where students get together in small groups. They can, we can use Zoom breakout rooms. Um, so they will research a certain topic and become experts on it and then teach it to their classmates who researched other topics. And this is a way for them to engage with, again, their classmates who are in person and at home at the same time. Um, and also, like Ms. Shadwari said, there are real opportunities for teachers to learn. I have learned so much since coming back in August. I have learned how to use Canvas. I've learned how to use Canvas with other tools the district buys, like uh, News ALA and SchoolNet. Um, I'm busier than ever before, but I'm more organized than ever before. Um, I love being paperless. I'm collaborating with my colleagues more than I ever have before as well. 
And um, the last thing I wanted to say is that I know that we are making a positive impact with our students every single day. I know that the one size fits all model doesn't work for all of our students. And I know that you guys know that with three early colleges in our school system. The Iredell State's full mission statement reads, we are a premier school system where students come first. All students will receive a high quality, relevant education in a safe and caring environment, which will produce confident, responsible, and globally competitive citizens. Our students will be college and career ready. And that is happening right now, every single day. We are meeting that mission every single day. Um, we are doing our best to keep students safe by cleaning to the best of our abilities and enforcing social distancing and mask wearing. We're holding students accountable and keeping rigor the centerpiece of our lessons. We're teaching students to take initiative and reinforcing personal responsibility for completing their schoolwork. I'm teaching my students how to read, take notes, and annotate an online textbook because I know that if they choose to pursue higher education, either at a community college or at a university, that is going to become a skill they need to have. I'm teaching them the proper way to format an email to a professor and become advocates for themselves when they need additional support. Um, teaching students online and in person at the same time is not sustainable long term, but we have found successes. Um, and there's so many issues and negativity in our society right now, but there are silver linings if we can look for them. Board members and Dr. James, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you for just a few minutes. And I just want to reiterate a couple of things. Wednesday has been critical. Wednesday is what has really saved us and energized us and allowed us to perform at the levels that we have at the high school level during these, this first quarter. That's been great. Uh, the energy level in the classroom is amazingly good. I spend a lot of time in the classroom and I am so impressed with the teachers and how they have stepped up to teach the online students and the students who are virtual at the same time and engage them and have them interacting with each other. Um, just a, a couple of comments too, as we move forward and whatever next semester looks like, um, we need to take time to look at the things that have actually been very positive in this first semester. And one thing that I will mention is what an opportunity this has been for a handful of students who would never have opened up and spoken up and participated and been engaged in a classroom of 25 students. When you have a class of six to 10 students, it provides an opportunity to, to get some uh, engagement and interaction out of a few students who never would have done that before. So there are benefits like that that we've recognized and, and that we can see and we need to figure out how to carry those forward and to, uh, to keep that going. Um, the, the fact that the current state is not sustainable long term is, is true. Teachers are tired. Teachers are worn out at the end of the day. So. It's, it's not sustainable, but I really appreciate the effort that the staff has put into making it sustainable for the time period that it has been. So I don't want us, I don't want us to lose sight of some of the lessons that we've learned, carry those forward into in the next semester and uh, figure, out, figure out what next semester will look like and how we're gonna make it work even better next semester. Thank you. And so those are kind of what I call COVID blessings. It's the things that we've learned from COVID because there have been some silver linings and some blessings from some things that we've learned while we've been through this COVID crisis. And so I always encourage people, look for your COVID blessings because there are some things we've gotten out of it. Um, one of the things I get to do that other people don't get to is I get to be in different classrooms in different schools. So when I was at um, Third Creek Middle one day, they were getting ready to tell me during open house, they said, oh, we're getting ready to do these synchronous learning classrooms which um, Ms. Smith's gonna show you here in just a few minutes. But while I was looking at those, um, while I was talking to some of those teachers, I said, hey, let me show you a video I got, cause Alexandria was very nice, Ms. Shadroy was very nice and let me um, have her videos <laughs> to her classroom. And I said, let me send these to you. And so I know that Marlene actually let her students or shared it with her teachers to say, hey, let me show you what's possible. So we get to share information between our schools and that's one of the good things about being able to go from school to school is we get to see things and get to share. Um, 
at Third Creek Middle. They're getting the state of the art deal. So come on, Miss Scott. Um, the, and I think I called you Smith. That was a Freudian okay. slip. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, the, we're getting ready to do the state of the art classrooms at her school. So she's going to talk to you a little bit about that and about what her staff has done. But I will also say that we've let each school kind of make their plan. And we have provided support, whether it's through coaching, through the um, IT department. We've had um, Canvas nights. We've had all kinds of things, Canvas day, Canvas support for our teachers. So if you hear a teacher who's really struggling and really tired and um, feeling frustrated, ask them if they've worked, talked with their coach. Ask them if they've talked with their principal, because these guys can hook them up with support. OK. Um, when we were thinking about um, the virtual process, we were really nervous because we're 84% economically disadvantaged. And we were really worried about getting our kids to show up just for virtual. So we started out with about um, 170 so kids virtually. Um, we have 468 students total. So I am happy to say today we have 322 kids now that are attending school at least two days or four days a week. And we've reduced our numbers of virtual kiddos to 146. And if you look at sixth grade, that means we have about 42 sixth graders who are virtual. We have about uh, 41 seventh graders. And of course, our eighth graders, who are our toughest group, are at um, 63. So we're working to try to get all of our kiddos in because we know it's uh, just really critical for our school. Um, one of the things that we're fortunate to have was the Apple TVs. And so we began talking to the teachers after they watched the wonderful video um, that was modeled for them. How do we do that? And so they started uh, day one working with teacher leaders and with our coaches, trying to figure out what would my video look like. So they started creating videos. So what I'm going to show you today is a variety of things. I'm going to show you classrooms where they don't have the fancy equipment and they make it work. And then I'm going to show you some classrooms where they do have this awesome equipment that we'll be able to use. So Jada, if you'll uh, scroll through for me. This is a math class. This is a math teacher. She has an Apple um, TV. She's using that Apple TV to post um, things that she's uh, showing from her computer. But you can't see right now, but she has a computer on her desk, and she can actually see her kiddos while she's zooming. So she can talk with her kids. You can't see the kids. You can see a few right there that are face-to-face. -face. Um, she talks with those kids, too, so she's teaching both face-to-face -face and virtually. If you'll click for me. This is another teacher. Um, again, she has her Apple TV. Notice she has two screens on her desk. So that way she's working uh, one screen to see her kiddos at home. And it's probably maybe 10 or more on the screen. And then the other screen is where she is navigating and posting things from Canvas. That's a copy of Canvas where she's showing them how to go through the Canvas um, thing. She is going to be one of the hybrid classrooms. In a second, I'll talk a little bit about what the hybrid classroom looks like. Okay, click for me. That's Mr. Thornhill. That's the math class. And I wanted you guys to be able to see kids sitting right there in front of him. And then his computer is up and he can see his virtual kids at the same time. So you'll see a lot of that this year where the teacher is having to get up and down. Um, and sometimes you see them stationary. That doesn't mean they're just sitting behind their desk. Um, so in observations, what we get to do is to walk behind the computer and we actually get to see those kiddos interacting with the teacher. Click again for me. And there's uh, Mr. Thornhill showing an actual math example that he's posted from his computer. Click for me again. And that's science. And we're going to get, and that's just a shot to show you what the screen kind of sort of looks like. Keep going. We were a satellite school too. Here is what is um, wonderful about what's happening at Third Creek Middle School. And I'm hoping we'll be able to have more classrooms like this. This is uh, the state of the art classroom. So what you're looking at right now is the one arrow to your left is the Apple TVs that we purchased for all the teachers to be able to project information like a like a, um, a smart board or a document camera, that's per se. And if you look at the back arrow, there's a there's a 55 inch TV in the front. In the back arrow, there's a 75 inch TV 
So I thought maybe on Saturdays I'd go over and Sunday maybe watch some football. I'm just kidding. But the TV that's 75 inches, guys, that's where the teacher can actually see her kids from home posted on that screen. And those kids can see the teacher and what she's projecting on that Apple screen. Okay, click for me. Um, and if you look at that arrow right there, that's a, a state-of-the-art camera. So that particular camera, guys, it's amazing. Um, that desk is strategically placed where the teacher is, but if she was to move around, that camera actually follows where she goes. So it had to be strategically placed. It took about two hours to set every one of these classrooms up. Um, click for me. In the center of the room, because uh, sound usually is a problem with your kiddos when you're Zooming, and the teacher has to be right where the computer is. So this particular company thought about that and said, hey, how do we do this to where the sound can be heard from anywhere in the room? So they went up in the ceilings, guys, and they put these nice speakers up or mics up. And so now anywhere the teacher goes in the classroom, they can hear. Even the kiddos who are Zooming, they can hear the teacher. She actually has to wear, uh, it's a mic that she wears and so when she's moving around that mic just stays with her and they can hear her. so this is exactly the kind of virtual classrooms that we really need um, I have more kiddos uh, who are loving the virtual um, who are able to um, have access to their work and their learning they do well um, those are the 146 students that um, are virtually but my other students um, are still getting the same rich learning if you'll click for me and I didn't get to post that, but I wanted you to see what the desk looked like. Every single desk has to be stationary um, because we actually drilled down the equipment because it is like high dollar equipment. So we drilled down um, all the equipment and that was my idea because um, our desk roll, our teacher desk roll, and we actually put tape around all the desks so the equipment stays uh, safe. Underneath every desk, nobody can see it unless you guys come, so I encourage you to come by the school and take a look at these classrooms. It is a motherboard underneath the desk, and you can see all the equipment and stuff that makes all that work. So what we're hoping is to be up and running with those classrooms by next week, fingers crossed. It does take a new MacBook Pro that we're working with uh, David Edwards on, uh, getting the teachers the MacBook Pros that they have to have because our MacBooks just aren't equipped to be able to do that. So um, that's what we're doing at Third Creek. Any questions? I was at Third Creek yesterday yes. and got the, I got the tour and got to visit some of these rooms. And uh, uh, Dr. James, thank you for bringing this technology. Uh, I think we've got 15 rooms we're starting with and then hopefully spreading it out. It uh, definitely is uh, going to be the wave of the future. And I, I'm looking forward to especially using it for some of our high level courses in our high schools where we can have a teacher at one school teaching at several of the high schools. I think that's going to be a, uh, a real good way, for especially some of our classes, our, our high-level classes that we have low, low numbers in. So uh, thrilled with it. Uh, Ms. Scott, it's always good to go out. You're so enthusiastic. Uh, I told Melissa Nieder today she wants to come see these rooms. Uh, 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 we were talking. I said I think she must drink as much coffee as you do because she just <laughs> you're bouncing off the walls even at two o'clock in the afternoon. So thank you for that, board members. Uh, we got questions or uh, for our, our teachers or principals. I just want I just want to say, Miss Scott, new school, new principal, and uh, it's pulled into my district now. But I just tell you. That's a lot of, lot of challenge, and you've done a real good job. I've been out there a couple of times to see you, and it's a real challenge. New school, new principal, so, and you've got a lot of support. All y'all standing over there, y'all are what, I'm telling all of you, you're what's making this thing go. It's a team, and, you know, there's no I in team, and it is a team, so you're doing a great job. And the schools I've been to, uh, everybody's just enthusiastic. I mean, it's, we're hanging in there, so appreciate what you're doing, so. We can help you. All you got to do is call. Everybody else does. <laughs> so go ahead. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter what time either. It doesn't seem like. So just go ahead and call us. Don't call me after 9. You won't get me. I'll turn my phone off. I don't turn mine uh, off. It stays on 24-7. I'm used to that being fire marshal. So just call me 24-7. I had a principal call me one time at 2 o'clock in the morning. 
would you go to my school and fix the alarm? I said, I'm not the fire marshal anymore. He said, well, you're closer than I am. So, Pasley, did you, do really, did you really do that? No, it wasn't okay. Mr. Pasley back there. He's, this principal's retired now, but um, that did. That's a true story. So 24-7, just used to it. So thank you all. I mean, can't say enough. And I do want to say I've never seen our teachers work so hard, and they are, they are burning out, uh, and that's why we've got to get to A, Plan A as soon as possible in our other schools, and I hope uh, Ms. Cooper and y'all are well on the way to having that plan ready to go as soon as the governor gives us a green light. We are planning every Tuesday um, with the middle school group and then planning with the high school group, so we are working on that. We're right now, currently, this week, our task was to assess which teachers are going to continue to stay with us and which ones feel are going to be afraid when we come back with a full classroom. Um, next week, we're going to be assessing the kids to see which of our kiddos are going to come back full time and which kiddos want virtual. So we've got um, systematic steps in place to work on that piece as well. Um, our principals are doing a good job with that. Um, so, and we're also, I will tell you that this week, one of our other tasks was to check with our teachers and do a temperature check to say, are you doing okay? Are you doing all right? But you need a little bit of support or, oh, help them drowning. So that was one of our tasks this week as well. Well, it's, it's been a trying time, but uh, the teachers I've talked to, most of them are, are exactly what you ladies said. They've seen a lot of silver linings in this. It's going to help us down the road. And uh, so that's the important thing is, is we grow from this experience. It's certainly not been the most pleasant experience in the world having this COVID, but uh, if we get something out of it, at least we've got something out of it. But I uh, thank our teachers again. A uh, round of applause for all our teachers. Come on, guys. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Yes, I'd, I'd just like to also say, uh, reiterate that what uh, Chairman Page just said there, to be ready because I think people are going to see, hey, we're successful at the elementary level. Hey, things have gone good. We've stuck our toes in the water here, and now things are go going okay didn't get my foot eat off and so I'm ready now and I, I really see this will come uh, probably before the end of the year is, is my hope that's what I would like to see um, and I know that a lot of the other board members would like to see it as well so I want us to make sure that we're ready for that challenge when the time comes because it may, will probably come much like the elementary one did I really didn't see that one coming and you know two weeks later here you are so Let's make sure that we've gotten everything that we can on the front end done to be ready for those students and uh, families that we hope are going to be coming back very soon. Mr. Chairman, uh, just a couple of comments uh, along with a couple of questions. Uh, you know, I'm still concerned, Ms. Cooper, and if you can kind of give us an a update on uh, Lake Norman High School and South Iredale High School, and how they are progressing since they have the overage of students and are not on the quote traditional you know a b schedule or whatever you want to call it, the two-day face-to-face -face schedule okay um i've actually had them report out to dr james and i on um, a weekly basis of how many students they've had on campus um last week i think that um South Ardo High School had over a thousand students on campus um, throughout the week. So students who are struggling have the opportunity to sign up and go. I've got, I talked with a mama yesterday whose child has been struggling somewhat and he's going all four days. Um, so, I, and I do know that they are reaching out to the kiddos that they're seeing that are struggling and trying to get them back on campus. Um, so that's one of the things that we've done there. Is there any, uh, you know, Mr. Ribbick talked about the uh, summer jumpstart funds, uh, and, and I know Dr. James uh, and Mrs. Wyke, uh, you know, would be looking at funds, but is there any way, uh, have the middle school and high school principals, particularly the sixth grade and the ninth grade, asked for any type of special tutorial after school work for them? Yeah, I'm just very concerned about those two particular grade levels and, and how the mandated state testing is going to go for them. We're very worried about it as well. Um, 
no we do not have funds there's for some reason when the state grants their funds they generally have all their monies kind of focused on elementary school and on the babies and they forget that we have kids that are in our grade level i have a um i was looking at some data today where we did a diagnostic at the high school level on a student who's still reading like on a second grade level so we have kiddos at um our secondary schools who need that additional support so i've got to be honest with you we're kind of sick over not being in school um john will tell you i kind of harassed him just a little bit i'm um, picking but i wanted my kids back too and i was like oh my gosh this is crazy i want my kids back and yesterday we were keeping our fingers crossed hoping that the governor was going to say okay let's bring secondary back so we really um mr carver to speak to yours we're really hoping that elementary goes really well and that shortly after they bring our kiddos back um, because we realize we've lost almost a whole semester with our high school kids i mean we're into october and december's the end of the semester thank you i have one question um second high school students they're close to ending first semester almost yes sir and they're going to have to take in the course test? Yes, sir. Um, How are you going to administer that? Uh, do they have to come to school? I think that there are some, I may be misspeaking, but I think they do actually have some things where students can be tested at home. Um, I'm sure the students would have to leave their cameras on while they're being tested, whatever, but, and the, there's a secure test site, but um, more than likely, I guess we will have to figure out a schedule to bring the kids to school. Um, we're still working through some of those areas, but as far as we understand, the information we've gotten from the Department of Ed in um, Washington is they are not waiving tests this year. You're a little concerned about that? Yeah, pretty much sick at my stomach about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Cooper, I, I just want to challenge you also. We have a board meeting Monday night, and uh, I would like to have updated numbers for this week how many students were on at Lake Norman and at South Idle because you tell me about a thousand and I'm thinking well there's about 1500 students there and so two-thirds of the students only came maybe one day you know and so I I would I'd really like to have that for next week thank you thank you all I will make a comment I did have a parent from South speak to me yesterday and uh was praising South with they said that they had really been in touch with with uh, he was just really bragging on on South uh, the guidance counselors and teachers being involved and now their kids are going there four days a week so uh, uh, I, I think we've all had questions on how well that's going to work their programs are working so that's a good idea to see see what it was but I did get a very happy parent yesterday uh, from South Iredale and I, we always are lucky when we get happy parent calls because that doesn't happen a lot so uh, any other questions thank y'all very much thank you all for all the hard work uh, principals teachers uh, assistant principals uh, our coaches it's been a, a remarkable ride I've, I've knocked on wood so much I've got sores on the side of my head from hitting it uh, when I people ask me how it's going and I say it's going remarkably well and that just shows the great planning that our people are doing the collaboration between everybody and, and our, our district leadership uh, and our hard-working teachers so thank y'all if there's no other comments uh, at this time uh, the chair would entertain a motion to go into closed session for personnel Consult with attorney regarding legal matters. Is there anything else, Dr. James? Mr. Chair, according to North Carolina Journal Statute 143-318.11, I make a motion that the board enter into closed session uh, to discuss personnel issue and uh, consult with our attorney regarding legal matters and to preserve our attorney-client privilege. Second. Got a motion second going to closed session. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Uh, at this time, we'll move into closed session. Thank you all very much.